So maybe we'll wait two or three minutes past 9.30, just because it's, I guess, probably the first session. And then uh, this is the presenter, right? This is the presenter. So I'll go forward, backward, simple. Pretty simple, even for idiots like me. And, um, and this is, uh, this is you, this is this you control? Yeah. So we're good. And it's the, pre oh, well, look at that. Thanks very much. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. We're going to maybe wait one or two more minutes just because it's the uh, first session of the day. And we're, I'm expecting many more people to come. We'll see if I'm, I'm right. Is there a special hashtag for this session? That's a great point. Um, Yes, there. Yes, there is. Uh, we're gonna make it up on the spot. Is there? Well, I, okay. Well. WS two sixty one. So we can go with w, WS261 as a, and, and uh, you know, it just rolls off the tongue. And, uh, and, then I would, and, and then maybe data trusts. First two words up here, data trusts. Okay. So that's the, that's the first order of business, sort out the hashtags. Okay, so I guess we'll get started. We have another mic over here. We're gonna make this a little bit less formal. Maybe I ask you guys, you guys could share that one. And um, everybody's in the center, so that's good. And so I'll, I should begin by introducing myself, then we'll introduce, uh, we're, we're gonna stand guys in front of the, uh, so you can maybe, I guess, oh, yeah. We're figuring this out. We've had a bit of a change. Okay, wherever, wherever. Yeah. So my name is Philip Dawson. I'm uh, I work at a company called Element AI in based in Montreal, and uh, this is the session that uh, our team organized. We had a, a couple changes in the last week and a half or so, where the uh, three panelists who are on the program all canceled, and uh, and so then it became just me. And uh, so you know, that's something you'll have to live with. And, and then uh, very kindly, I, I have two, two colleagues of mine, um, Ruhia, Dr. Ruhia Seward from the International Development Research Center and Mr. Philippe André Rodriguez from the Government of Canada, um, who are familiar with the topic and are also interested in the topic personally, have, uh, have uh, agreed to, 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 to work with me in this session. And, uh, and instead of, it was originally organized as a panel, what we're going to do is we're gonna have a kind of more of an, an interactive kind of pre presentation of, on data governance and specifically data trusts, and, and then um, open it up for a question and answer. And uh, here you guys have to say about some of the points that come up. So um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Ruhia to say, to in, just introduce yourself and where you work for, and your interest. Sure. Hi. <clears throat> well, Philip introduced me, but um, I'm a senior program officer in the Technology and Innovation Program at um, the Inter at International Development Research Center, IDRC. And IDRC has been working on data-related issues for over a decade, you know, from open data to big data. And now we, um, we work a lot on artificial intelligence and different kinds of um, 
human rights approaches to data governance, among other issues, and we work in the global south. So IDRC um, seeds and works on um, developing research ecosystems and policy influence in countries in all across Africa and um, Asia and Latin America and the Middle East, which is actually where I'm based. So we look forward to discussing this topic. It's a, it's kind of a frontier issue and it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a small seed in, in what we're thinking of, but so I'm curious to hear from all of you and if you have an interest in it and if you're doing any work on this. So, you know. Nope. Hello, uh, Philippe André Rodriguez. Uh, I'm a senior policy advisor uh, in the government of Canada. So I have an interesting position in that I sp uh, spend some of my time at our foreign affairs department, Global Affairs Canada, where I work at the Center for International Digital Policy. Uh, and we've worked quite extensively on AI and human rights. So we've worked on developing the global partnership on artificial intelligence that you may have heard of that is now within the, the, the framework of the OECD. Uh, we've worked extensively uh, with the Freedom Online Coalition uh, on developing uh, normative language around AI um, and a few other things. And the rest of my time is spent uh, at uh, our Privy Council office, uh, which is the part of our government that, that uh, serves our cabinet. Uh, and the Prime Minister. Uh, and so right now, uh, as you may know, Canada just went through a change of government and the questions uh, surrounding data governance, digital governance uh, are front and center in terms of the new mandate. Um, and so we're here both to uh, discuss this important uh, tool that uh, is data trust, uh, but also to get information in terms of how to shape uh, the direction of our policy going forward. Thanks very much. So before we begin, I just want to get a sense of who is here. Uh, and we won't go through introductions, because that'll take quite a while. But who is here from governments? Who? <laughs> just one. OK. Kind of. Not sure. <laughs> political party. Political parties? Anybody from a political party? So one political party, one government. How about civil society organizations? OK, a few more. Private sector? Okay, even more. And what about academia? Okay, a pretty, good, pretty balanced group. Okay, so I'm going to hold you to account for this. We now have an official multi-stakeholder meeting. Um, okay. So just to begin, we're going to start off really, really basic before we get into data governance and data trust. What words come, come to mind when you think about data? Okay, and there's some, I'm going to get a couple of the easy ones. Uh, out of the way first, so you know I think privacy is one. What are some other ones? And you can just put, um, put, you can put your hand up or say something from your seats. What, what are some of the words that you think about when you think about data today? Protection. Protection. Transparency. Transparency. A resource in the back. Uh, open, data open data sharing. Free. Okay, yeah. Over here? Bias and, Bias and control. What about power? Power is another one, yeah. Any other words? What about data governance? Some of the same, same words may apply. Anything else? Data leaking. Data, leaking. data economy. Data economy. Value, policy, policy. Data, ownership. data ownership, maybe decisions, decision making processes. Anything else? I think for me, power comes back again. Does this help? Data governance is uh, a very complex constellation of structures and people and outside forces or the structures we use to make decisions about how data and you notice it in this in this uh, you can say this is either augmented or virtual reality or blindfolds right so let's go back the structures we use to make decisions about how data is collected managed shared 
used and deleted. Okay, so that's kind of the basic understanding of data governance that we're going to go with. It's it's very simple. It's the decision. It's the the structures we use to make decisions about how data is collected, managed, shared, used, and also deleted. Anything else? Is anybody else something to add there that maybe we're missing? No. Okay. So how does it work, you know, in, in the real world? How does data governance work today? What's going on? Do we have, uh, who's in charge of data governance? How does it work in the real world? Well, mostly so far without us. This is a, and this is a slide from one of the panelists who was supposed to be here today, Sean McDonald, his or organization, Digital Public, but I really liked how he phrased this. How does data governance work today in the real world? Well, mostly without us and what comes with that, that um, is that we often don't really know. <laughs> so some of you um, may have seen this story in the last week, but the California DMV is making 50 million a year over selling drivers' personal information. I don't, you know, this is definitely without driver's consent. Uh, it includes people's names, addresses, other personal information to generate revenue, right? So this is, this is, a, a, this is, an, this is an example. What about Project Nightingale? Some of you probably would have read about that in the last couple of weeks. And you know, these are just examples in the last like 10 days, right? That we see more and more of these all the time. Uh, this is an instance in which we, it was a whistleblower informed the Wall Street Journal, and this was in The Guardian, that uh, informed that Google was acquiring the intimate medical records of 50 million patients. Uh, information that was not de-identified uh, without the knowledge of doctors or patients involved, for what purposes, um, not entirely known. And the, and the investigation is still unfolding. This is an example uh, I heard recently at a conference um, where a, a group of people had set up a, a support group on Facebook. Um, and they had all, uh, what they all shared in common was a predisposition to uh, to uh, to to cancer, and this is something they learned. Uh, it was a genetic uh, disorder that they learned when they were young, and had affected their life in different ways. And they had come together on Facebook to share information about their experiences, and often very sensitive medical information about their experience. Uh, and you know, the last few slides illustrate the extent to which you know. In this context as well, this particular group of people had very little control uh, over, their, over their sensitive personal information once it was on Facebook. And what do they do now that they've been sharing that information for almost a decade on the platform? Another word that I, I think about well, when I think about data or data governance is accountability. You know, how do you hold uh, the... The, the companies that, that govern data accountable. Here's, you'll remember in the last year or so that uh, Facebook had refused to uh, respond to subpoenas in, in a variety of jurisdictions. Here we, we see in California, but also in Canada, to appear before the International Grand Committee uh, to, to, to uh, testify regarding the events surrounding Cambridge Analytica. So accountability is another word. Succession, we talked about resources, assets, data as, as, as bringing value. What happens uh, when, there's, when there's no provisions for, uh, what happens to data after an entity dissolves, uh, or a not-for-profit entity without much resources? This was in a case where uh, a huge amount of data, uh, research uh, collected over five to 10 years, I forget exactly the number of years, disappeared on the, on the uh, and this was research that had been publicly funded, and then it just ceased to exist after a not-for-profit uh, dissolved. What happens to the, to the succession of data as an asset? So the current framework is, is largely governed by terms and conditions, and all of us, are, uh, I think, are familiar with that exercise of clicking through terms and conditions and are familiar with some of the problems. So first, they're non-negotiable. It's a take it or leave it situation. You either accept the terms and then you have access to the service or you choose another service provider, 
right? That's kind of how it works. And the terms and conditions we know are very long and complex. One of the problems of the situation is that there's no other model out there. And part of the reason there's no other model out there is because there's, there's not much competition among, um, among, in the technology sector, especially in the large, uh, the large platforms. But there's also not a lot of competition in terms of innovation around data governance. There's, there's kind of been this race to the bottom. So there's no real choice uh, other than to succumb to the current framework, which revolves around terms and conditions, which are lengthy and complex. And some of you may be familiar with a study from 2008 where, uh, that reported that 244 hours of time is required to uh, for any, the average individual to go through the, all the terms and conditions that they might engage with in a given year. That's 2008, so that's almost 12 years ago. You can imagine how that has scaled since then and how that will continue to scale. So we often talk about the, the problem of privacy self-management, and it just, it's a burden that individuals no longer should be expected to carry. Uh, there was another uh, statistic that, uh, that reported that a third, of the, a third of the terms and conditions of Fortune, fi Fortune 500 country, um, companies required a postgraduate degree to understand. So there's length uh, and, co and complexity to understanding how our data is collected, uh, how it is used, how it is shared, and uh, I'm not sure how often it's deleted, but uh, we put that in there just for, to be comprehensive. <laughs> So the current framework gives people little control over, the per over personal information, it leaves people vulnerable to privacy and other human rights abuses. We don't often know what's happening with our data. It concentrates data in the hands of some companies. There's a lack of representation in decisions that are being made about the use of our data. Often there's an exclusion from value. We talked often about targeted advertisements that, are, that uh, generate an enormous amount of value is one of the principal w uh, ways that data is being, uh, extraction of value from data is being carried out, and that has really nothing to do with the individuals whose data, um, who, individuals who have participated in generating that data. And there's a lack of accountability. So these are, seem, these are just some of the problems uh, in the current approach to data governance, which is based on terms and conditions, which is made some of the largest technology companies in the world, the regulators of personal information in all but name. Um, so I'll just read this for you. This, this just goes back to the, the problem of privacy self-management and, and being uh, unable in the current circumstances to anticipate different risks. The complexity and opacity, and opacity of information flows makes it virtually impossible for individuals to discern much less self-manage the risks or rights they engage when consenting to the use of their personal data. We are not equipped to make these decisions. We are not able to understand the current context, the future context of decisions that, uh, that relate to the use of our data, and this exposes us to great risk. Privacy is one of them, security breaches other, but, uh, but also more broadly, other human rights, including discrimination. So we need, we need new approaches. Right? We, need to, we need to start innovating on data governance. Uh, we, and this isn't, this isn't gonna, hap isn't gonna happen without uh, you know, a, a collective, uh, a group of people from different, um, different um, constituencies uh, discussing and thinking out loud about how they would like to see the future of data governance evolve. Um, these are just some of the things we're looking for. Repeats, uh, uh, kind of response to some of the la the the, uh, the problems in the current framework. We want greater control. We want to address asymmetries of power that exist between corporations and individuals. Protect privacy and human rights, and and also enable other people, the public, to share in the value of data. So these are some just some of the kind of aspirations for new approaches to data governance. So this is a shot of a workshop that was held at, uh, at my, the company I work for, Element AI, about a year ago, where we, we, did, ju we did just that. We took advantage of, hold, of hosting uh, a large international meeting at our office, is actually the, the G G7 Digital Ministers meeting, to invite a bunch of different people who were attending that meeting, but also people from the Montreal community, to two days to, to think about a, a new approach to data governance based on uh, on, in trust law, data trust. 
And we, we went through a variety of scenarios uh, um, after uh, reviewing some of the legal foundations of this new form of data management and, and, came, up, and came up with a, what we thought, um, you know, based on some of the research of experts who were there, uh, Sean McDonald being one of them who is going to be, a, who is a panelist today, and Sylvie Delacroix, another panelist who, who couldn't make it. But, the, you know, some, some of, the, some of the, the current research on data trusts and tried to tease out how it might be applied in different contexts. Okay, data trusts. What's a data trust? Who here has actually been following some of the data trust uh, conversation? Who, or who has heard about how, they, how they've been applied? I want to hear first what you guys think what a data trust is. Sir? No? Okay, no. <laughs> Anybody else? So, yes? Well, it, it kind of depends. Um, it, it does. Uh, that's, it sure does depend. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that was, some of you might, might be familiar, there, one of the most visible discussions in the news about data trust occurred in the city of Toronto as uh, Sidewalk Labs, an Alphabet affiliate that, um, that is, is one of the, um, the, the contractors of, this, of the uh, Waterfront Toronto, uh, a, a government entity that has put out a bid for the redevelopment of part of the waterfront, uh, Sidewalk Labs said, well, the way we'll, we'll manage uh, the data collection and use in the context of this project is through an urban data trust. Um, and a lot, of, you know, a lot of that sounded kind of good, um, on the, especially on the outside, and, and some, of the, some of the proposals they had um, in it were actually great. Uh, responsible data use guidelines, impact assessments for invasive data collection. But they, they stopped short of, uh, you know, of, of other uh, components of a data trust, including trust law and fiduciary obligations, so a key component there that attracted a lot of criticism, for one. And two, there was, a, there was an absence of, uh, of meaningful consultation on, in the proposal. Um, so it, it might have created another top-down situation in which a, a large uh, technology company defined the terms of, of what this data trust could, could be. Okay, so, that, that's a, so the Sidewalk Labs example is a, is a, is a key one, and it, it, it certainly illustrated the fact that you know, a data trust is not a solution in and of itself. How you construct it, who's involved in constructing it, um, all of these things uh, will, will shape whether or not it is effective and serves some of the purposes that we just discussed. Anybody else? Another example of you know, something they've read about data trusts or an idea of what a data trust might be? Okay, so this is a very, very basic uh, definition. Um, somebody actually told me recently that it's still not very basic. But a uh, data trust creates a legal way or a structure that helps with the management of data rights for a purpose that is valuable to a beneficiary. So and we come back to, you know, a lot will depend on who is the beneficiary, who is doing the management, who, what is the representation on the, on the, on the board of trustees, uh, who is engaged in, man in managing the, the, uh, the, the access and use of the data. This is kind of the basic definition that we're going to go with, okay? So it just creates a, a new way rooted in trust law that enables us to manage data rights for a purpose that is valuable to a beneficiary. I hope you can see that, but uh, we'll go in a little bit more detail. So it's, specifically, it's the application of the common law trust to the management of data or data rights. And, and you know, that's a key point because there are other instances in, in, other, in other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom where uh, you know, data trusts are being talked a lot about and, and they're being talked about in ways that, have, that do not include any reference to trust law. So, so the way we're talking about it today is specifically rooted in trust law and leveraging uh, components of trust law, including fiduciary obligations, to enhance the, the um, obligations of the trustee who's managing the data. So there's an asset that's put into the trust. Here we're talking about data and data rights. Trustee would then have a fiduciary duty, could be including duty of care, duty of loyalty, and these are other concepts that need to be unpacked. Duty, a fiduciary duty to manage assets for the benefit of an ascertainable group or of, of a person, 
in, in accordance with certain terms and also the purpose of the trust. So, you know, the purpose for which the trust has been creative is, uh, created is also very important. And in combination with the fiduciary duty, it gives a kind of a proactive, forward-looking responsibility to the trustee who is, who is then managing the data on behalf of beneficiaries with a kind of an ongoing, purpose-driven risk management approach, uh, ensuring that, that, their, uh, that their, their interests are, are looked out for. The trustee negotiates access and use on behalf of beneficiaries. And there's built-in accountability because, uh, and this is just a feature of trust law, where you have the personal li liability of the trustee, okay? So you have direct accountability and, and built-in legal, me built legal mechanisms to, to enable uh, the trustee to, to, to remain accountable. And you also have a collective action mechanism. You know, some, there have been extraordinary advances in comprehensive data protection legislation in the, um, in the last few years. Obviously, the GDPR is one of the, the uh, is the, 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 the leading uh, example there. But still, data rights are exercised individually, right? You, what, you can imagine the difference that might, might, might be created if together we were able to pool our interests uh, through a trust and exercise greater leverage vis-a-vis -a, -vis a data controller, you know? If you had, if a data trustee could withdraw uh, data rights for a group of 5, 10, or 50 million people from uh, a platform that, that might have more sway than if I made a, a, an individual um, request to access some of my data or to port it from one company to another. Okay. Look at just two examples or theories of data trusts that have been talked about. Uh, we've touched a little bit on this one so far, or at least uh, what some of the, the, the critics of the Sidewalk Labs uh, urban data trust uh, were advocating for. Uh, civic data trust, okay? So this, is, this would be a data trust that incorporates civic participation directly into the trustee organization. So you could imagine that uh, uh, community groups or uh, city officials or um, I mean, other stakeholders who are outside of the government entity or the you know, sidewalk labs, the vendor in this case, would be participating in decisions about the use of the data. You could maybe the, the Department for Urban Transport that is going to be involved in, so, uh, in, in, in some of the decisions about how the data is used could be represented on, on the board of trustees. So, it also just illustrates that the point that was, that was made that, you know, the composition of the data trust, how it's, cr how it's created, has a huge impact on what type of decisions are made and what type of value is, uh, is extracted from the data. So this also promotes public interest and accountability and decisions about the collection and use of data, and it has an impact on uh, sharing of value from the data. So the first, this is very, just basic features of a civic data trust. Uh, often think of public sector projects, municipal projects, but it doesn't have to be. It could be community-based projects. You know, it just, the, the core features here are representation on the board of trustees and it extending beyond simply the data controller. There's something called the bottom-up data trust, okay? This is kind of a way, is conceived as a way of returning the power that stems from aggregated data to individuals. So if all of us got together uh, today and, uh, and pooled our data into a trust and established, I don't know, maybe we chose a purpose that the, the data that, uh, let's say, is generated from our rides in, I mean, no, none of us take Uber here, but just pick your, your ride, uh, maybe, maybe some of us do, I do sometimes. But the, the, the pool, the data that's collected from your ride-sharing trips or your, your, in, into, into a trust uh, that is not, uh, that does not belong to the, to the company, then maybe we would set up a trust that has the purpose to support urban transport or sustainable transport in the city of Berlin. Or maybe we'd make it accessible to other cities that don't have, uh, that don't have access to, I don't know, that type of uh, data collection platform that ride-sharing companies create. Okay, so the bottom line is that you're empowered to pool data into a trust that would champion a social or economic benefit of your choosing. 
the data trustees act as an independent, independent intermediary that negotiates the terms of data collection and use. So this is the, the, the part where, you know, the, the, this addresses some concerns about privacy self-management. You know, we, the, the fact that we can't individually do this on our own anymore and be effective at it. So maybe we need some type of professional data trustee, I don't know, or a trustee organization or a group of them to help us ma manage the, 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 this burden. Um, and, and then also we have uh, the, the question, the, the, uh, the advantage of pooled or share uh, pooled, pooled interests that uh, helps the d data trustee effect more, uh, exert more leverage. In this particular conception, and this is credited to Sylvie Delacroix and Neil Lawrence, they say that an ecosystem of data trusts, and not just one, but you have to have a competitive environment where data trusts compete around um, you know, the, the value they bring to people, to people uh, well, the, the, way, the, the manner in which they are able or effective at championing a social or economic benefit of your choosing. So there's a, there's a, a competition aspect here, and you know, this is the viability of this type of ecosystem is something that still needs to be applore, uh, explored, but this is, this is the ideal. So an ecosystem of data trusts in which data subjects could choose a trust that reflects their aspirations and be able to switch trusts when needed. You know, so that you're not beholden to a particular uh, trust, and if the, something happens that the trustee does that you you do not in, you, don't, you do not think conforms with your interests or the terms of the trust, you can leave. Okay. We talk about smart cities. We'll go quickly through this. These are some of the examples that came up at a workshop at the workshop we held at our office. Uh, but, you know, in smart cities, data, civic data trusts or data trusts could be a way to safeguard the public interest, first with th third-party stewardship, right? So it's a separate entity from the companies involved in the project. Uh, it's a new entity that has the purpose of managing the data collected from the project. It's a participatory model of data governance, so you get other stakeholders involved in the decision-making process. And then, the, as mentioned before, the representative nature of the trustees has a huge impact on, on, on uh, trust in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the usual sense of the word, and the legitimacy of the, of the data trust itself. We talked about health data, and some interesting challenges came up. So you can imagine uh, there would be an, there's an interest in, in, in increasing access to data for research. Um, and, but people have different interests when it comes to health data. You know, some people who have been, who have been quite ill, they may be more um, predisposed to sharing data because they have a, a, maybe a stronger sense of their interest in advancing research in a particular, uh, for a particular disease. So you know, that, create, that's, that could create an incentive to share data, but it also then you know, could predispose this particular group to a certain vulnerability, right? Whereas healthier people may not, may not be as interested in participating in data trusts. So you know, it was, a, it was an issue that raised a lot of some of the challenges that come with you know, giving control over data or greater control over data to people, uh, when, especially in the context of very sensitive, sensitive data. Some of the challenges also come from data of shared provenance you know, um, and medical imaging. So you have Say I'm, I go in for a, uh, some type of a scan. Um, I participate in generating the data, but so has, so has the doctor who has performed the scan. And if you're in a public healthcare situation, uh, maybe the hospital or the government has an interest in the data that, is all, that has been generated. So you have this data of shared provenance situation where you know, if, you, if the data is in a trust, who actually has, uh, who has authority to withdraw rights to, to accessing that data? Does it, do all three groups have to, have to agree? Can they? Even if they're all on the board of, of trustees. Anyway, this, is, you know, this illustrates one of the, the complexity of, of uh, you know, thinking about new approaches to governing data. Uh, because data is not something that is held exclusively by one person. It is, is usually there's some, some concept of shared rights over data that is in play. We talk about portability and erasure rights, and, uh, and then we already mentioned variable patient participation. Online platforms, we talked about this briefly um, already in the example of ride sharing. Um, so I won't go, won't go into it as much. 
But often people, people, when we get to talking about online platforms, they say, well, how are you ever going to get a company like Uber or a company like Facebook or, or t to, you know, to not collect their own, da the, their own data, but rather have it pooled into a trust? Well, uh, I think ride sharing creates uh, an interesting situ situation where these companies often have to obtain a certificate to, a certificate to operate in the jur jurisdiction where they, where they want to. Uh, well, it could be, made, could be made a condition of the licensing process, right? Um, so I think that that's a little bit more feasible. For social media platforms, uh, I, would, uh, I would encourage you to look into some, some legislation that has been uh, proposed in the U.S., in the, in, I think in the Senate. One is called the Access Act. And they're starting to talk about different intermediaries, okay? Intermediaries that would assist the public in managing or as an interface between the public and platforms. So, okay, so it's, it's a very, very, very similar concept uh, to what we're talking about in data trusts. Okay, implementation challenges. We've already got into a few of them. Maybe I'll just stop there and say, ask if there are any questions on some of the things we went through. I've been going pretty quickly. Any questions? Oh, okay, everything is crystal clear. Oh, there's a question. Yeah. Right. So it's so then I guess my reaction to that would be to say we have to think of, of a way we have to we have to you know think of structures of data trusts um, may not be dependent or or any data governance model may not be de dependent solely on whatever value comes from it, but it's uh, about who gets a say in some of the decisions that are made. Or and the purposes, not not just the value, but the purposes for which it might be might be used. But that's a, that's an interesting point. We don't really know the the value of the data that is being collected from us through the, all the applications on our phones every every day. We don't we don't really know that. Uh, yes. Oh, great. I, yeah, so I mean, this is this is uh, this is obviously still theory, right? But uh, this isn't happening. But uh, I think the the way the way I conceive of it is that it would go directly to the trust, and a platform like Facebook negotiates its own access with the trust based on the terms that, for instance, you and I have have agreed to in the trust, so or that we have that we have established. Okay, so then Facebook would then or a platform like Facebook would have a license to access according to terms that respect our trust and the purpose of the trust, and our trustee would be able to revoke access to the data for some, for some breach of the terms. Okay. Now, is anybody, there's a lot of talk about value of data, which yeah. you just mentioned nobody knows, but um, are there any people thinking about trust for the purposes of enumeration for data, whatever value it may have to whomever wants it? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure about that, remuneration. Yeah, it's, it's a hot topic. Yeah, okay. All right, well, I'd like to chat with you more about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, far at the back, yes. It's very complex. Yeah. 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 Which are not like binary correct and incorrect, but are kind of going to be judgments. 
Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's some of the challenges that I see in like the trust. In fact, as they get more useful and bigger, it makes the kind of the structure of the trust uh, harder to manage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that is. Maybe we'll take one more question. I'll try and respond to other. And if, if you guys have want, want to uh, respond to either of these questions, uh, please uh, please feel free. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, just following up on, on kind of on the last point there, that there seems to be kind of a lot of assumptions that are going into uh, this idea of a data strategy and actually being a good idea. One of them being the idea that basically the individual should be the focus of all this and that it should be individual privacy and individual responsibility. So again, there's a lot of like putting pressure on the individual. There's a lot of research that's been done that says that people don't understand these things. I would argue that at least I don't, I don't think my 75 year old mother should be like to have to handle these kinds of things, and in the past they had. Um, the other way that we can view these things is as a collective issue, um, because you know, for instance, if personal consent actually isn't legitimate uh, when handing over my data affects others, which is what happens when you're just dealing with big data. So in a sense, um, you know, I think we also have to question whether the whole idea of data trust as opposed to some other kind of public control that's focused on society, with the data trust or a trust focused on an identifiable Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, maybe I, I can. Uh, well, I'll, I can respond to that, and then, but I'll maybe go first to the the first question. Um, absolutely, I think uh, I think a lot of it will depend, and I think some of these norms are are in flux, and I'm not sure which way they will go. But the level of uh, the granularity or specificity with which a decisions about. Uh, our data. One, I think, you know, right now there's there's none, right? It's uh, we have we have absolutely no idea what is happening, um, or or any any way to exercise s some control other than, well, I mean, uh, as a collective, right? Um, an example I think about sometimes uh, is uh, is when you when you choose a portfolio to invest your money. You know, you often don't always know all of the. All, and maybe I'm opening up a, a huge can of worms here, but Philippe André, maybe you can respond to that. But you know, you don't you don't always know exactly. Uh, you know, all the decisions that are, that are being made, you get you get reports, right, about what happens, what type of transactions are happening in your portfolio, and shows how it respects like the the, por the terms of the portfolio that you're involved in. Maybe this is a, hu a helpful analogy. Um, but there are also. Um, technological solutions that would have to be created, uh, and some of them already are in terms of managing permissions and access. Uh, this is something that is, that is, that is happening. Uh, uh, high levels of automation are being used uh, to help manage that. If you think of in, in identity management uh, uh, the field, that, that, is, that is, is highly evolving. They're also beginning to use AI to help to learn uh, you know, you know, differentiated uh, uh, uses or requests for access uh, that could be applied to, let's say, a hybrid trustee that is part uh, automation, part AI, maybe for like the low-hanging uh, fruit or like low-value uh, transactions that that meets clearly meets certain criteria. Then triage to uh, you know the the, fl the flags that go up for different transactions that that humans would maybe triage. So. I agree with you. This is like this is one of the this is actually one of the implementation challenges that we that we would be coming to. Um, did either of you guys have wanted to jump in on any sure. of these things? Sure. Um, well, so first of all, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think it's useful to remember that you know there is a relatively large body of work on trust law generally that can help in terms of some of this decision making. Um, you know, a general concept that comes to mind there is just notion of due diligence, right? Like there, there will be mistakes that will be made and some individuals may be unhappy about some of the decisions being made on, uh, on, on their behalf, but the reality is that when you manage the data of a multitude of individuals, usually you will have some checks and balances, some accountability mechanisms to ensure some kind of due diligence. Obviously in the context of data trust, it's still kind of, unclear what this would look like and there's a lot of questions at different levels of technicality that would have to be answered um, but I think the idea at this point at least in a, in a more theoretical setting like this is and it goes back to your question is 
uh, what are some of the underlying principles that we would want to have to shape uh, data governance and to see whether data trust can be a vehicle through which these principles uh, can be implemented. And I think there uh, we can learn a little bit from actually internet governance. Um, because it seems to me, looking at this pr uh, presentation, hearing it, uh, that there are kind of three principles that come out of it that could be useful to drive uh, the, the design and, and implementation of the trusts. And I would say there that actually they, they are very similar to those that we usually use when we talk about internet governance writ, writ large, which one is, uh, as you mentioned, human rights. So rights respecting, um, grounded in, so grounded in law, so in order to, to allow for you know, uh, freedom uh, against discrimination, uh, due process, uh, once again, due diligence. Uh, so I think that would be one of the ways in which to ground the development of, of uh, data governance and data trusts. The second is uh, multi-stakeholder. Um, I think, as you pointed out, when you have a situation where the, da the data governance added is being uh, present now is usually driven either by industry alone or by government alone, which creates problems uh, in and of itself. Uh, and then a third one, which actually comes from the multi-stakeholder uh, lessons learned in the last little while is that you can be multi-stakeholder and be extremely elitist. So you can be a very top-down type of multi-stakeholder governance. Uh, you know, with we've seen the professionalization of civil society uh, organizations, for instance, that may not represent uh, the wider, the wider uh, audience. And so a third uh, principle there could be something like inclusion uh, writ large. And what that actually entails, once again, would, be, would have to be uh, better mind. But I think those are kind of three principles that could help potentially shape the way uh, to think about governance and to think about trust more specifically. Thank you. And then I think just to respond to, to your point about uh, whether some of these situations should be handled by private, private trusts or if there's a role for public trust, that's, you know, that's, that's is one of the questions. And it goes back to like, who, who should be setting up the trust? Who should be the trustee? Uh, and, and who do we trust to do that? Right? So like the idea, like the statistics agency, you know, whichever, uh, you know, government country you're from, uh, public statistics agency, like, you know, should that be like, I don't know, should, there, should, should, should data that is collected by that agency be coming from a, tr a private data trust? I mean, I would tend to think not. Uh, but, you know, it would, it, would be, uh, it would be case by case and depending on, you know, who, who, do, you, who do you trust to, to manage this data? And I think it's, it's often not going to be just one entity, like uh, Philippe André said. Can I also yeah. just add, and which is, it's also that, I mean, the idea, I think that what we find interesting about the data trust model is that it is, um, that it could act in the public interest of the members of the group, for instance. So I think of refugees. So refugees, for instance, right now in many situations are giving up their biometric identification with absolutely no protection at all, and it's being sold or used by a lot of different actors and no one actually knows. And none of those people have any control over that. So imagine a situation where there could be a, you know, a public interest trust set up where, that, where there would have to be some controls on how it's being used so that it's not being picked up by private sector you know, security organizations that are doing all kinds of nefarious things with it. So, you know, you have to sort of think of it. I mean, I think of the trust as being something that would be in the public interest so that it's not up to the individual to always be making constant decisions about where this is going. Yeah, I think you have a question now. <laughs> So basically, that seems kind of the question is actually comes down to who's going to make the decision. Should we? Should it really be, for instance, in, in, in your case, should it be the government of Canada sitting down with Facebook and Google to negotiate the terms of trust, which is kind of what you get in a multi-stakeholder situation, or should it be should it be the government 
basically, uh, basically kind of like surveying all the various interests and then coming up with legislation in their definition of public interest. Because it comes down to, like you say, who defines public interest. Can I go ahead, please? Thank you for the question. Uh, I actually agree with you. Uh, I think the concern coming from the multi-stakeholder uh, model uh, is more related to the fact that yes, in Canada this might work, might not work in every country. Uh, not every country may have the capacity to actually understand uh, or to implement rather uh, a trust that would work uh, in practice. So the question is, yes, maybe in Canada, and actually I would say in Canada it would be a lot easier to go through a government-led process in part because of one of the main challenges, I think, related to trust, which is the cost. Uh, obviously one of the issues that we see, at least from a Canadian perspective with data trusts, is uh, this notion of you could select a trust or another, what's going to happen is, you know, the, more, the most fortunate would have great trustees working in their interests, and then what happens to those who cannot afford a trust? What happens to the most vulnerable? Uh, those who don't actually understand anything about uh, their, 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 their data and may give their, uh, the, their, their data to a trustee that might not work in their interest. Uh, so in the, in the context of at least a society which, with a robust government that will do this check and balances, that will engage with civil society, that will engage with the, its population, yes. But there's a broader concern from, let's say, a global perspective of, well, if we implement that model, are there any possibility that it would be used against the public in other contexts, and how do we fight against that? Uh, and that's kind of the challenge there in terms of, you know, you want to implement a situation that works, yes, domestically, but how do you implement it uh, beyond uh, your borders? Oh, there, were, there, was, there was a question here, but then we'll go over to you. Um, for the Green Party, the solution here would be um, to, to um, go for decentralized um, structures with the judiciary as well as intermediary structure, but uh, with two different. Uh, one is that you need to get that trust um, um, to, to have a multi-layer system. <coughs> so you have a policy board to make decisions, you have an uh, administrative board or organization, and you need to have a technical layer. Mm. So, and so you have, like in democracy, you have a, a separation of powers, mm. and that's a helpful structure. Mm. And uh, the second thing is that the judiciary uh, function is not the only one, but uh, the, the structured intermediary structure has also some notary function hmm. to be a uh, uh, notary of, of the process, hmm. that the process is in terms of law. And then you can scale that model into something like um, you can pool, decentralized pool, in a very small uh, 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 way for just some civil uh, right groups, or you can do it in a, in a, in a huge uh, nationwide style. So you, have all, you, you can scale it in every uh, uh, dimension you need. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, yes. it, it, I think it goes back to different countries have, have, have some different approaches. Uh, I, I'm wondering that because we conduct we basically our entire daily life and Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good point. And the. Uh And that's that's certainly something that's uh, been talked a lot about in in uh, for platforms, especially in the United States. But what if we make them the platforms themselves fiduciaries? What if we if we apply fiduciary obligations or say that you are now given the 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 relationship you have with the the internet users? Um, 
you have a de facto fiduciary obligation uh, towards them. So, you know, I think, I think there could be some positives from that, but uh, I, I do know that there's some people who have criticized, uh, the people who have criticized that, that approach point to the, the impossible situation that a, a platform could be in, in which they have a fiduciary obligation to you and I, and a duty, a, a primordial duty to their shareholders, right? And that could that could place that could place the you know the the duties in in conflict. Wouldn't the bank be like that? The bank has fiduciary responsibilities, and other private sector companies do as well. So this is a good point, and and some some of the people have tried to understand how this might work is to understand precisely what is meant by fiduciary duty. Is it a duty of care or a duty to do no harm? And that is actually more similar to what banks have. Uh, <laughs> banks have a, du a duty of care, duty to do no harm. Uh, to to their clients, that's part of their fiduciary duty. There's also what about a, but they don't have the type of positive duty of loyalty that might involve acting in you know your best interest according to let's say terms of a trust, right? So that's you know that's from my understanding that's where the conversation lies and why you know it, it's a, it's an interesting idea that is still being unpacked. Um, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? We have a couple more. Topics to go through. Over here, yeah. Okay. That's a very good point. So, you know, what happens to the data that uh, miners participate in generating or data about miners? You know, there, uh, I think you know, there, is, there is existing legislation uh, in place that could help us understand uh, the rights of miners in relation to data. But uh, I think another point you mentioned about is really just the overall need for transparency. And if you think of data trust, one of the things that we were chatting about before this started is that, you know, what are, what are some of the fears that could, what could happen with data trust? What, you know, what could they could they turn out to to be, um, you know, shelters like like trust law has been used in the past to shelter money, to shelter to shelter other assets. Could data tr could a data trust ultimately just, you know, exist as a shelter for uh, some of the worst data practices that uh, that you could imagine? I think that's where the even your point about transparency is extremely important. And so. And I know that um, I know that in some jurisdictions, including in Canada, they see using data trusts in 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 society. Um, to to use to do that, you would have to have some type of uh, statutory oversight capacity or enforcement, um, so that you would be able to to audit the practices of data trusts or to to understand what their practices are, and and then to 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 ensure that they're complying with, with the law. Okay. So some of these uh, we've talked about already. Choosing a trustee, this is, this is an, not so much an implementation challenge as a, a, a recognition that data has become extremely political. And so what is, who, what is a legitimate trustee and who should be a trustee is something that is, you know, is negotiated uh, through a, ideally through a democratic process, right? It's not clear who should be responsible for managing the data. So far, right now, we have like large companies that are doing this alone behind closed doors, and we want to we want to um, 
to bring transparency to that process and bring other actors involved, but we don't always agree on who should be the trustee or part of that trustee organization. That's uh, just kind of a, a consideration. Nature and scope of fiduciary duties, we touched on that a little bit. You know, what is the duty of care? What is the duty of loyalty? Uh, what's the sliding scale? Like, what, what level of intensity of a fiduciary obligation is appropriate to something like a platform, another company, another large data collector? And another issue is that, you know, these, these are common law concepts. They, they are functional equivalents in civil law jurisdictions but are they understood in the same terms? How do we talk about them if this is going to be something that is, is it could be transnational? Scale of data transactions, this was, this was mentioned. You know, what are we gonna do? Um, aren't we just going to be replicating a new burden of privacy self-management? We gotta choose our participation in you know, hundreds of different trusts. Uh, and how do we manage like, how the trusts are using our data? Right? This, is, this, is, this is gonna be, regardless of what data governance approach you take, this is gonna be something that we have to reckon with. Right? If, it's a, if it's a trust model or if it's not, what, whatever, all the choices about uh, data access and use, the, the scale is increasing every day. So I mentioned people, who, uh, people in, um, are, are starting to research the, the, um, these hybrid models where there's a level of automation that is required, and some, some humans who also act as trustees, for instance, um, or even personal AI trustees. Now this is like thinking you know, far into the, in, into the future and also comes with some of the, some of the challenges that Philippe André alluded to of like, you know, how is a personal AI trustee something that everybody's going to be able to afford? Uh, you know, wh what are the costs of that? Is it, is it something that the government might decide to provide for, at a, as a baseline for free um, as, part of, as part of citizenship? You know, these are some of the questions uh, that have to be answered and explored, but um, and and you know how do you deal with um, you know walking into a smart store that has uh, sensors all over the place, and if we walk in together and my sen my setting my settings on my my phone where my personal AI trustee is are different than Philippe Andres, how you know or is the technology able to? to capture that you know, and, and communicate our different preferences and ensure that my information is completely de-identified in a way that is not exactly the same as Philippe André's if his preferences are different. So you know, regardless of whether it's a trust or not, uh, these types of approaches to data governance, these are some of, the problem, some of the challenges that new approaches to data governance have to fa uh, ha will have to address if we're to, to move beyond the status quo. Talked a little bit about jurisdiction and harmonization common law and civil law, uh, technical architecture. Talk, I mean, this is not a, really my forte, but we talked a little bit about pers automation, personal AI trustees. Uh, you know, some people have, have said that this, uh, that the data trust, legal and governance literature should really, it's time for it to merge with some of the uh, um, federated uh, trusts or that are, or not necessarily trusts, but uh, solutions like uh, Tim Berners-Lee project on solid, uh, where there's a distributed, uh, distributed network. Um, you know, so these are some of the questions that are being explored. And then here is uh, just a kind of a final quote um, that is from uh, an article that a colleague and I wrote recently for uh, this year's AAPC Gizwatch publication. Um, if the data trust agenda appears ambitious, this is as much an indication of data trust promising features as it is a reflection of the public's aspirations for data governance in the, in the digital age. I think these are some of the things that we're looking for. Uh, we're trying to, to see if data trust is a solution, uh, um, or, um, and, and you know, this, is a, this is a work in process, but things that are important to us, representation in decisions about data making, data, um, how data is collected, shared, and used, shared rights to data, uh, so that we can also uh, participate in extracting value from it or choosing how value is distributed, account, real accountability, and, and then also remedying compensa compensation, which we haven't talked about. But so, so these are some of the features that we think data trusts could respond to, whether, whether it's a, they're a trust or not. Um, these are some of the things that we want. Um, and it's, I think it's continuing to guide some, some of the research uh, on data trusts. Any more questions? Or comments from, com questions or comments from, yeah. Oh, great. So, um, one deals with the fact that um, 
so we are individuals and we have given our data to a data trust yeah. will because now our data is uh, completely spread over the internet so will these companies also give data to the data trust will they be mandated to give da data to the trust so that we can regain autonomy over this data that the companies originally or now have and the second question will be, uh, do you have any idea on how you are um, uh, deciding the size of these trusts? Because, I mean, it's going to be a, a huge data set across nations globally, et cetera. So, I mean, um, are we like going to make them national trusts, like regional trusts, local, like company-based? So what are your ideas on the size of the trusts? And are the companies also going to give back the data to these trusts? Okay, so the first question, the first question is about do the do the companies the companies that currently are, are the large data collectors are they collecting it directly or they, or is the data going into a trust? Is that the question? Yeah, are, they going to give back the data? are they going to give it back right now? The data that they already have. Well, that's a very good question. I don't know if I, I, I can answer that one. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. The uh, you know, any, any type of action like that would obviously require uh, legislative action. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I don't, I'm not sure that that's what's being contemplated by, for example, this Access Act that is in the, the U.S., uh, been tabled in the U.S. Senate at the moment. Uh, if anybody's aware of more details of that, that piece of legislation, please feel free to comment. But I think the idea is that there would be a, uh, there, there would be an intermediary and that um, manages the use of the data by the platform and in, 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 in a non-uniform way. So it, it may also depend on what you want uh, the, the platform to do for you. Um, and so I was, as one of the questions that came up before, I think I could see a situation in which, you know, uh, for, uh, if you were here at the beginning of the presentation, there's the, that group, that, well, the Facebook group that, uh, created, that established itself to be able to share about some of the sensitive medical issues that they were, they were all going through. Now, if I was part of that group, I would imagine, I, I, would, I would like to be able to, uh, when I'm creating the group on Facebook, indicate that the data collected in, in, this, in this group is not going to reside uh, with Facebook, but in a trust of, let's say, a trust of our cho choosing. But maybe there's a lot of information that you know I, I don't care as much about that I'm a little bit more comfortable having a company like Facebook uh, have access to. And maybe there could be shared access. You could also, ch you know. So I think, I think you know, there's no answer. I think uh, uh, these are some of the, some of the um, some of the answers that we all need to participate in in, uh, in defining. Uh, and there was another question. Oh, the size. I mean, I, I don't think there. I mean, I, again, I, I don't think there's there's a, a set answer there. I don't know if it, if, if I, I could conceive of trusts that are local that are uh, that have not many uh, participants. If they're depending on what project they're for, you know, if they're for if they're if it's related to some community project in 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 the you know the the specific area of Montreal that I live in. Like, I don't think, you know, there would be, I don't know if there would be a need to set a cap of like who, uh, you know, but it would probably be bounded to the people who are living I inside that community with maybe some exceptions for, for other stakeholders. But, you know, I think it would be it's highly context specific. Um, and, uh, then, and then, you know, maybe there could be transnational data trusts. But in terms of setting a cap or like ensuring you have, frankly, sufficient uh, participation for it to be worthwhile, in a sense, uh, you know, th those are some good questions. No, because I am actually afraid about the decision making there. Like yeah. We have a million people in a single trust. How will they make decisions? I mean, I, I, I understand the integrity will be like, made later on, but then even uh, the board, etc. how will they decide? Like, how will they decide that each individual gets the chance to um, make decisions for themselves if it's such a huge size and some people disagree with some decisions? Well, so I think, you know, we've talked a lot about trust law, but there would be other, other important features of this type of structure would come from just normal corporate governance. You know, and so you, we do have ways for millions of shareholders to have a participation in the governance of a company while they may not be on the board of directors. So you may have, uh, so you, would, you probably would have, uh, you know, you could think of like a data tr a trust Trust law applied to normal corporate governance structures um, of, a, of a, a typical corporation. I think that could be one way. Any other questions? Gentlemen over here. Um, 
thank you for the many enlightening information really that we shared. Um, one of the things that lead us to data trust is accountability and mm. being accountable for the data or the information that I am presenting. Rather than starting with regulation and governance, uh, uh, I mean, it will be much better to start it as a culture. I mean, don't say something <laughs> as long as it is correct or reliable or have. A, can, for example, we establish an, a, 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 or is it a practical to say, as we are certifying, you know, accounts today and uh, in a similar manner, accounting, certifying accounts in social uh, networks like Twitter and Instagram, this is a social, this is a certified account or can we say, for example, a tag or something like that, say, trusted source of data. Uh, so uh, whatever published from here, it is referenced, uh, sourced correctly, uh, something like that. Does an idea like that looks practical rather than jumping into regulation or, let's yeah. say, governance? Yeah, yeah. I'm, part of the like part of the attractiveness of a solution like this is that it could be a private law mechanism of of dealing with the governance of data without a whole lot of need for new legislation or regulation, which. As you know, as we know, is can be pretty difficult to come by, right? So maybe it's something that that we can use in the mean, if if anything, in the meantime, to to govern new projects that we have, that how data is managed with new projects. It may not immediately address, be used to address problems that come from platforms or existing data 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 controller situations, but for for new projects that we have that are data driven, uh, you know, we can create these on our own in some ways, right? Um, I think another thing that you uh, alluded to is the importance of, uh, of industry standards, um, and if whether it's about the, the the provenance of data or data quality, uh, you know th these are these are efforts that are underway in parallel to data trust conversations a little bit all over the world. Whether we're talking about data collection quality or standards for how data is accessed and shared, um, or even you know metrics for what is a trustworthy AI solution or an explainable AI solution. All, all of this, I think, is part of the enabling environment for any data governance model or, frankly, enterprise data governance you know, within a company or within in a community. So you know, looking to things we can do on our own through private law or you know, standard creation, I think there, there may be a lot that we can do with that. We had uh, Philippe André, I think, want to respond, and we had a question over here in the back. Uh, just quickly, uh, so you mentioned uh, the, 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 the notion of culture, and I think actually the trust can be useful in that sense, given that you can have a trustee that can reflect the cultural reality of a certain community uh, and act upon it. So I think actually, you know, if we want to take a cultural approach to this issue, I think trust can be an interesting mechanism uh, you know, and I, I think it, at least in the Canadian context, that's one of the reasons why we're interested in that concept is exactly because, you know, in a multicultural setting like Canada, having these trustees that can represent uh, various different parts of uh, society can be uh, a useful way to deal with um, some of the tensions that can uh, exist in terms of a broader data governance uh, structure. Okay, well, I think we had this gentleman over here, then a question over here. Who is first? Um, I, I wonder about a few things. So first of all, you mentioned the idea about uh, that one of the advantages of this is that we can uh, rely on, pr on basically private law, in other words, contracts, in order to handle these things. But of course, that actually removes a lot of accountability because you also said, you know, without having to go through the legislatures. Legislation is where you have accountability in a democratic system or one of the areas where you have democratic accountability. Um, and when you put things in private law, it might not be a big deal if it's, say, one, a contract between, say, two companies or something like that, but when you've got a contract that, that regulates how people's data is used, that means that their recourse has to be through the courts, most of the times or some kind of tribunal, which can be time-consuming and expensive and, due to the, and is vulnerable to, the, uh, to what's in the contract, which is actually probably harder to change than legislation. So there's, there's, some, uh, there's some problems there. Um, and that's one of the things that we actually
actually see uh, one of the concerns in the, uh, in the Toronto project. Um, and on the idea uh, with respect to the multiculturalism and how it would be great if you have, uh, you know, to have these councils because they would be representative, well, in a representative democracy, you already have that with respect to government. This is government's job to represent the people and to represent, you know, for instance, in Canada's case, our awesome multiculturalism. Um, so uh, I, I wonder here if it's, this is just kind of a, a way of, of dancing around the issue of, like, who is going to make the decisions. Um, can uh, data trusts solve a situation of, uh, solve, can, can they work in a situation where a country has poor governance? Um, I don't think they, I don't think they can, or rather they will work just as well as the overall society will work because it's still the same people, it's still the same institutions that are involved in this. And so like thinking about this, oh, well, you know, it will work well in Canada, but we've got to export data trust because other countries have bad governance. Um, I don't really buy that. Okay. Res maybe can we just respond to this? I think the first part of your, your question or, uh, or some of the comments. You know, I, you know, I didn't mean to suggest that, you know, data trust and the private, private law is a type of silver bullet that in and of itself could, uh, could replace, uh, you know, either, you know, democratic processes and, 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 le and legislation and, 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 and regulation. Certainly all of those, frankly, would still continue to apply. And as Philippe André said, you know, many of which, many of, it, of which should be, uh, should be used to condition kind of the governance of data trusts. If you're talking about hum privacy or human rights, um, or you know other theories of other theories of, of agency, but in in trust also there's um, you know there there is built-in accountability structures beyond lawsuits, right? Whether it's it's arbitration or whatnot. So you know there there are some other um, other um, possibilities beyond just going through the courts, which I would agree with you as a, a former litigator. Uh, you know you, you can get two years before a court date. Um, is sometimes it's actually longer than passing or changing regulation, right? So I think I'm not, this is not to suggest that you should that data trusts should be pursued uh, one uh, as the unique solution or as this, uh, that you know there's no need for new legislation and regulation. You know, lots of co uh, countries are in the process of considering amendments to their privacy legislation, as an example, um, to um, bring it in line with some of the GDPR uh, like. Uh, provisions um, and others, and I, you know, I think that's extremely important too. And also, you know, that's that's uh, that's the democratic process. In some ways, I do not think, though, that you know that will uh, cover all. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure how, to what extent that can cover all all solutions, or if you know we can rely on the government to be the 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 and uh, or legislation or regulation alone to be the way that we govern data. Um, and so, you know, this would be, there may, it may be that there, this would just be to fill some of the gaps that you have as solutions like other data governance models, including data trusts, uh, that is part of this entire kind of governance of data ecosystem. So, you know, that's a little more, I think, how I see it. So I, I appreciate your, your points. Philip. Uh, yeah, so just, I, I, I agree. I think you cannot replace legislation by trusts. Uh, I think that's obvious. Uh, the question that we have, at least from our perspective, is more, can it be a supplement? Can it be another tool in the toolbox on data governance that could be used in addition to, let's say, uh, a general data protection regulation? Uh, because obviously this is going to come, but is it enough? And I tend to agree with Philip that maybe we need additional tools uh, to ensure uh, an even more robust uh, data governance structure. Uh, but I, at least I don't think it's anybody's claim that you know, we should replace the role of the government by you know, private law. Uh, because yeah, there's a lot of issues, a uh, lot of issues that that, that would raise. Uh, and I actually agree with the other point, and that's kind of a concern from a foreign policy perspective is how will this, this if this tool is implemented or is enabled in a uh, context like Canada, what kind of message does that send abroad? Uh, and how, how could it be used for purposes that are not in line with the ones used in a Canadian context, for instance? And I think that's a that's big concern on our part. Um, because you could see, I think, I mean, you raised the point, I think it would be very easy to see ways in which this would actually undermine 
or uh, yeah, undermine even more vulnerable populations worldwide. So I think th th those, qu those questions are still there. Uh, and we're still kind of figuring out going through them, uh, which is why, you know, I, when I started, I said, I think from our perspective is we're still exploring that concept and how it can be implemented in all of its kind of implications. And we're th not there yet in terms of, you know, selling a product or coming to a decision. There's a question over here. Maybe just before the next question, I'll, I'll, I want to share something that, you know, from been to many workshops now that I've been, I've participated in where, uh, the, uh, where questions like yours have been raised. And it reminded in one particular uh, workshop where people were, were thinking about how, like the composition of a data trust and the questions were like, wow, like how do we make a group of uh, a, a trustee organization uh, representative and uh, democratic and how are we, and it, you know, it, it, forgetting that we actually have these democratic institutions that are part of our government, right? And in some cases, like the, it may be that an entity from the government, which is democratic uh, and has democratic processes built in, could play, could play that role. Right? So I'm very interested about the concept of data trust, since I come from a country where um, even if we have local legislation and data protection, um, what I've observed is when it comes to, um, for, in, for instance, personal data breaches of major platforms, our citizens do not really have access to remedies, right? Because there's no way that local um, data protection authority can actually have enforcement power over corporations that are not there. So my question is, how can we ensure that a data trust will be accessible to peoples of these countries so that um, if the local data protection authority doesn't have enforcement power, then at least the citizens can avail of another avenue for remedies. That's a good question. I think one of, one of, the, uh, one of the questions about um, trustees' ability to exercise uh, the rights of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the people who are part of the trust you know, is, 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 is addressed by your, your comment, or your, at least you touch on it, which is that you know, can, we, can we assign the rights we have in data to a trustee who can then sue on our behalf? Uh, and, 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 and in a way that we can now uh, obtain a remedy on our behalf for like, I don't know, uh, a large group of people. Uh, I think that's a, that's a question that may, may be that in, in uh, supporting regulatory changes would be required to enable the trustee to exercise those rights on people's behalf. I don't, that's kind of like a partially uh, addressing your question. Okay, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? We have we don't only have like a few minutes left. Well, thanks very much. Um, I don't know, Philippe André or Ruhia, if you had wanted to uh, to share anything before we close. But um, for me, I'll just say uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for all your questions. Like these are, um, you know, some some of the questions that come up a lot. There are some new questions too, uh, and new comments that I, that I've heard. Uh, so I hope it was interesting uh, to all of you. Um, and uh, if you want to to read a little bit more, and and this is, I hope you believe this has nothing to do with me, but um, this is this is a chapter that is in that I mentioned that is in this year's APC Gizwatch, and it is it is really like a survey of not just data trust but fiduciary. Um, data governance models. Um, it touches on information fiduciaries, uh, it touches on data trusts. Um, it's not very long, and it, and it has a lot of uh, references to other people. Uh, and I think, if anything, that's probably the most value of it. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quick read that gives you an overview of some of these ideas, some of the implement, implementation challenges, and then, uh, and then a list of, of many other uh, resources where you can read a little bit more about this topic. Uh, and, and actually, that, that's a publication that's getting launched tomorrow. Um, in room four, so not you can you can stop by and see, uh, you know, some of the other chapters that are in this in this uh, this year's edition of uh, APC Gizwatch, which touches on human rights development, um, AI human rights and development. Okay, so it's a it's a it's a it's, it's a great publication. You should check it out. Did you guys have a Sure. Uh, so I guess uh, just some concluding thoughts on my end uh, to kind of sum up what at least I take away from it. I think one, uh, 
the point that Philip made in his presentation that there is already a governance structure in place. Uh, you know, sometimes we tend to think there's a gap, there's a void. Actually, there is already a governance structure in place. It's just that governance structure is extremely problematic, which is why we need to find solutions to, uh, to imp improve it or completely replace it. Uh, so that's something that I think we need to keep in mind that, you know, there is a, maybe not a sense of urgency, but there is a sense that we need to act um, because otherwise that governance structure will simply uh, continue to exist. Second, I think uh, something that really came out in the questions, um, the problem of data governance is global by nature. Uh, we have to think about the implications internationally uh, of any type of uh, governance structure that we decide to implement domestically um, because it may have uh, important ramifications elsewhere. And it's something that we tend to forget sometimes when we think about these issues. Uh, but this is, I think, a big part of it. Um, and then I guess the third one would be that we still need to think long and hard about the kind of principles that we want to underlie uh, any type of, gov of data governance or governance in general. Um, because any type of legal tool that can be implemented, as we saw, can be implemented in the way that goes against the public. So even if the tool in itself can be useful, if the principles underlying it are not the ones that we want to see in our society, this may raise uh, fundamental problems. So, you know, I mentioned rights respecting, multi-stakeholder, and inclusive, and maybe we have to think, and I'm sure we have to think more, but I think this is another part of it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks for being here.